Welcome to Conceived in Liberty, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, President of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us for this special edition of the series featuring the 2021 Bradley Prize winners. I'm so pleased to welcome today esteemed historian and author Amity Schlaes as our guest today. Amity's knowledge of America's economic history gives her really great insights in today's economic challenges. Amity is the author of four New York Times bestsellers, The Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression, The Forgotten Man Graphic, an illustrated version of the same book, Coolidge, a full-length biography of our 30th president, and The Greedy Hand, How Taxes Drive Americans Crazy. She's also the author of Great Society, A New History. Amity currently chairs the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, and she's a 2021 Bradley Prize winner. Welcome and congratulations, Amity. Thank you, Rick. What a wonderful piece of news, and it's wonderful to be part of Bradley. Well, it's great to have you here today, and we're, we're so looking forward to the ceremony. Amity, let's, let's jump right in. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, people were understandably worried that we were about to enter another Great Depression. And as a result of that, the government has injected massive amounts of stimulus uh, funding into the economy. Based on your scholarship on the Great Depression, was that a good idea? Not particularly. Uh, I mean, what was the pandemic? It was a tragedy and it was an opportunity. And when the economy shuts down in some dramatic way, and our shutdown was dramatic, you can also use that period as an opportunity. What do I mean? We could have applied stimulus, well we did, and we could have also made the United States relatively more competitive so that money would flow to us and help our recovery post COVID. We didn't know how long COVID would last, Um, How would you do that? For example, you would cut the capital gains tax, the tax on a transaction of a a sale of stock or real estate, for example, to some dramatic low level. And if you would interview economists, whether they were socialists, Marxists, centrists, progressives, conservatives, social conservatives, or libertarians, there'd be very few who would dare to deny that if you cut the U.S. capital gains tax rate in half or down to 5%, cut it more than half, that money would not flow from all the world into the United States and help it with its wonderful recovery subsequent to a pandemic. That didn't even come up in the discussion because it sounds like it might be help for the rich, right? Uh, So there was a whole menu of things we could have done to help us out of the pandemic that we didn't do. We kind of made people feel better during the pandemic, all right, but we don't have endless money after the pandemic. And now um, with our impoverished menu of one item stimulus, here we are running out of stimulus money and pretending we're not. What a difficult situation to be in. Absolutely. Uh, Amity, a year and a half, after the pandemic began, we have a worker shortage. You hear about it from everyone. And and that really was just the opposite of what was anticipated. And there have been several theories about why that occurred. One, of course, is that COVID-related unemployment benefits are just lasting too long, which effectively disincentivizes people from working. And another is that people laid off during the pandemic are just looking for other opportunities. What's your take on that? Well, uh, Rick, both of those are true. Um, One of the things that I learned uh, in my review of 20th century history is that the labor price matters a lot. That it's not just theory at the American Enterprise Institute or Bradley or in a professor's class that people evaluate relative incentives and disincentives and make a decision. They really do look around at their choices. When was the first time that happened that we recall very well? was in England in the 20s. They had um, very uh, much strong support for labor in that period. Working in a factory was really hard in the 1920s. There weren't the protections they are today. It was bitter work. Um, And in England, they created the dole, as they called it, to help people who might be laid off 
um, have some money when they were laid off. And the reason we don't use the word dole today, even uh, Franklin Roosevelt knew it was a pejorative, was it became a pejorative, a bad word, because a lot of people said, well, this dole is better than working in that honestly very rough factory. So I'll stay home a little while. And that costs companies a lot. Unemployment insurance costs a lot for companies and hurt the UK economy. And the whole experiment was well remembered, so well remembered, uh, we, didn't, we didn't conduct that experiment in the United States. And as I mentioned, even um, a more progressive president, even in the Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt said, well, we don't want any dole in the United States. We saw what happened in England when there was no incentive to work. So it's true, if staying at home is easier, uh, sometimes people will do that, particularly if work is hard. And it's, it tends not to be good over the long term because they get out of the habit of going to the office or working remotely, or they nurse weird fantasies about um, what they're worth in the marketplace um, without necessarily always going to school to increase their economic value to an employer. Um, and it becomes a real problem. Uh, that's just the first example, the 1920s. Uh, in the Great Society research in the 60s and 70s, I saw the tragic way that we accustom people to not working and what a sorrow that was. And that's part of the general discussion today, right? Even before COVID, once I was speaking to a uh, high school, and I was talking about food stamps, that is in-kind payments where you get something, a little sticker, a card, we have different names for it, SNAP, but anyway, subsidy for when we're buying groceries. And I was um, criticizing Richard Nixon, because um, Nixon expanded food stamps uh, as well. It's a bipartisan habit to expand food aid fostered by our agricultural lobby criticized Richard Nixon for doing this because he was supposed to know better since he was supposed to be a free marketeer, the president in the early 70s. And a girl got up in the class in the hall and said, you're shaming people who take food stamps. How dare you do that? My family takes food stamps. Um, and I think the answer there that we can all agree on, and this has to do with the problem you're describing, Rick, is it's no shame to come to want. It's no shame to take food stamps when you need them. But we can agree as a society that it is a shame if one expects not only oneself, but one's child and grandchild to always be on food stamps, hillbilly elegy. We, we want our children to have opportunities to work. And most of us believe work is better than not work most of the time. So how do we get a society that helps our children to experience that and contribute to our economy? Let's stay on a related topic. The, the pandemic ushered in $6 trillion, at least in new debt, and that might be growing, bringing the total U.S. debt to an all-time high of nearly $29 trillion. It seems that that just isn't getting enough or even any attention at this point, should it? How does the soaring debt impact the long-term prospects of our economy. We're talking here about when we will feel what we've done to our currency. Yes. And we don't know when, we can't know when. Imagine you're in a sailboat, um, because I know you're on the water. Uh, you're in a sailboat and you're going out and you're behind the peninsula. So it feels very calm and you're, maybe you have the motor on and then you pass the last piece of land and all of a sudden, it's a different situation and your boat nearly tips over unless you're a good sailor. That's the way inflation is. Um, well, maybe we haven't felt in that way because we haven't passed our peninsula, but we are debasing our currency. And when will we wake up? Well, what will be the moment where the world wakes us up where the wind from beyond the peninsula hits us on the big lake? Um, or the big ocean? The answer is, um, in our case, I think it might be a challenge from another currency. We just don't know what currency that is. And one could start with the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is really just an expression of distrust in the currency of reserve, which is the US dollar. Um, it may not have all the components to go all the way to challenge the dollar, but something else might. For example, Rick, 
something that had a commodity uh, in its makeup um, and were uh, backed by cool companies such as Google or Microsoft or Nike, and maybe had a government in the background. Um, so it were, say, the Chinese Google copper-based currency, the, such a currency might challenge the dollar, particularly, and, and if had we had this conversation 20 years ago, we might not have even be, been able to imagine a challenge to the dollar. Um, but now with the world so digitized, it, we can see that it's possible and that money can move very fast because of digital banking and because of people's imaginations. We never could have imagined the um, non-commodity-based Bitcoin. So, so, or, um, so here we are. I, I think very likely a currency or a government plus a currency will challenge us and suddenly we'll feel inflation or devaluation of our currency, whatever one wants to call it, in a bitter way. And uh, you and I um, are, uh, at least I am old enough to remember that um, through my parents, uh, the high increases in the interest rate of, yes. of the yes. 80s. So that you wanted to buy a house maybe with three bedrooms because you had three children, but you bought a house with one and a half bedrooms or two bedrooms because of the interest rate. Um, it just meant your house was smaller than you hoped, one fewer bedroom, one fewer acre in the yard, whatever, um, a, a, a reduction in the quality of life. And that, that's what inflation can do. Amity, last question. Perhaps no one on earth knows more about President Calvin Coolidge than you do. You wrote a full length biography about him. You chair the Coolidge Foundation. What is it about Calvin Coolidge that drew you in as a scholar and what are some lessons that we can learn from his presidency? Calvin Coolidge was actually a very Midwestern type, even though he was from Vermont. Right. Why do I say that? Because where did Vermonters go when they went away, when the canal came, the railroad came, and so on? Well, they went to Wisconsin and Illinois and Minnesota and then parts further in the plains, where it was easier to farm than Vermont, which is basically a rock. So there are plenty of Coolidge types. Uh, I'm from the Midwest myself. I'm from Chicago. One uh, I've encountered in my lifetime before I met Calvin Coolidge on paper. That is to say, uh, understated people who don't like to exaggerate, maybe don't speak a lot, certainly don't praise every employee every day. Uh, and so when I encountered Coolidge, who was a restrained man, he was uh, familiar to me and very likable. I, I think another way to say it in business terms was Coolidge on a, was also the Arthur Anderson type, uh, the uh, agriculture type. He, he probably um, didn't have expensive cufflinks. Don't want to offend anyone, you know, and so on. He was very, what we would think of as Midwestern, which is really a bit farming culture didn't like to talk about the money he did have, uh, bad luck, right? Uh, very Midwestern. So I like that about him. And that is also essentially American. As a person from a, uh, a, a farming community where farming was tough, Vermont, um, as I say, Rocky in Vermont, the farms, uh, the humorist Will Rogers said the farms don't lay, they hang because of the rockiness and, yep. and the actual village of Plymouth Notch where the Coolidge Foundation is based um, once the agriculture department went through the survey and the agriculture department found it there was scarcely an acre of Plymouth that was genuinely arable. Imagine being a farmer in a place you can't farm. That was the Coolidge's, they, they were naturally uh, good savers and Coolidge uh, thought, well, you should always cut the budget and you shouldn't talk about your money. And he, did, he didn't think that because he was cruel or stingy. He thought that because it was uh, safe. And he also felt that about the U.S. household. And getting back to our point, well, why should anyone care? If the U.S. government can spend all it likes and the stock market will still go up. Why should we praise a saving president? And what was different about then that Coolidge even felt the need to say what was different was the dollar was not king dollar as it is now. It was in competition with the uh, pound sterling, for example. And we had kind of come out the victor after World War I 
after an armistice, who was still one of the winners of World War I and our currency uh, and, you know, uh, um, as a place, an investment goal, we were pulling ahead, but our place was not sure the way it feels now, inevitable and permanent. And so we had to have a stronger economy than the United Kingdom and be more conservative about our money. I mentioned the dole and the social democratic experiments of various governments in England. And we had to look better than England, which also was saddled with more debt trouble than we were. And by the way, we did under Coolidge because he had a very restrained presidency. But a second answer to that, Rick, is that Coolidge, today um, we often ask, why is the president so powerful? And we question the imperial presidency. Maybe a president shouldn't be like a king. Coolidge understood that. He had a conception of the presidency that's exciting and refreshing to us, which is the presidency of restraint. One third of three branches of government, he studied Locke and Montesquieu and he knew that. And he, he pulled the government back. Under Coolidge, uh, the budget actually dropped. Today, when we speak of presidents cutting the budget or joining Congress and cutting the budget, we usually mean restraining the increase, don't we, Rick? Coolidge actually cut the budget. So when he left office after 67 months, the budget was lower than when he came in wow. in 1923 to 29. Wow, how did he do that, given that the economy and the population were growing? He also cut the debt dramatically, the debt from World War I. So there's that. And of course, he also cut tax rates. He was very important to Ronald Reagan. His Coolidge uh, was brave enough to cut tax rates and found this was Coolidge's early iteration of what we would call supply side experiment, that when you cut tax rates, you get more money than you think if you're the government because of the increased activity. Kind of a Walmart principle, cut the price, make your profit up on, a, on the volume of sales. Uh, and all that was there, and he was polite, he never said mean things, even when he had enemies, and he certainly had people who thought themselves as his enemy. Think of uh, Bob La Follette, right, of the progressives who uh, ran against him in 1924 and got 17% of the vote just about. <laughs> Coolidge didn't say and mean things. Well, that, that's very exciting too. And Coolidge beat the progressives and the Democrats, actually. He was a Republican combined in a stunning victory. So that's a campaign model we, we wouldn't consider today. Someone for austerity, winning in a landslide, it's kind of refreshing. Fascinating. Somehow I think the founders would agree with Coolidge's approach. Amity Schlaes, thanks so much for your time, for your insights, for your perspectives. We truly do appreciate it. And as always, thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of Conceived in Liberty. Thank you.